There's absolutely nothing like summer in Brooklyn, New York. There's this rhythm to it, a cultural syncopation that just doesn't seem to exist anywhere else. From bed to Brownsville, Fort Greene to East New York, Crown Heights to Coney Island, this rhythm, it's familiar. And even though COVID-19 continues to cramp life on the city streets this summer, and Black Brooklyn is, well, less Black these days, the unmistakable soundtrack of the Brooklyn that many of us know and love is still hip-hop. Hip-hop as we know it might have been born in the Boogie Down Bronx, but some of its greatest MCs came out of Brooklyn. Rappers like Biggie Smalls, Jay-Z, MC Light and Lil' Kim, Most Def and Talib Kweli, and of course, one of modern rap's architects, Big Daddy Kane. As an MC just beginning in 1982, Everything I knew about rapping, I had learned from Brooklyn. I'm Tremaine Lee, and this is Into America. Today on the show, I sat down with none other than Big Daddy Kane himself, who is returning to Brooklyn for a concert to close out summer. We talked about the evolution of rap music, the soon-to-open Universal Hip Hop Museum in New York City, and the culture that birthed America's most popular art form. I caught up with Kane while he was in his home studio in North Carolina. Peace, good brother. How you feeling today? I'm great. I'm great. I want to first give a shout out to my big brother, O, who put me onto your music when I was young, young. Like, if you didn't have a brother with good taste in music you missed out. So I appreciate my brother for putting me onto your music early in the game, man. That's what's up. Thanks a lot, O. Yeah, man. It's an honor that, to, to have you here. So so paint a picture for us, though. So when you think about the summers of your youth when you were coming up, before hip-hop was hip-hop, talk to us about the way it smelled, the taste, the sounds. You're Brooklyn growing up. Paint a picture for us. You know, coming up in Brooklyn, like, as a little kid, everything was going to the block parties mm. and hearing the DJs play. Like, there was cats like Master D... Um, Vaughn K, and they would come out, you know, around in you know, Roosevelt Projects, or sometimes um, Mike Music would be on, like on um, Lafayette Avenue, on Van Buren, Lexington, somewhere over there, and they come out and they the block party is rocking, you know, somebody moms is uh, cooking hot dogs mm-hmm. and, and, <laughs> and selling them to the kids, you know, um, you know that type of thing. And the Brooklyn anthems back then was Love is the Message by um, MFSB and Bra by Samande. And those were like the breaks that whenever they threw them on, you that's when cats would form the mic line and get up and want to rhyme. And, you know, you had like a few gangs in the area that would, you know, come through every once in a blue moon. You had the Tomahawks, um, the Outlaws, the Jolly Stompers, you know, that was coming through. When did you first become aware of hip hop as an actual thing beyond the parties and the break beats and everything coming together. But when did you realize like, yo, this is something different? When I first became aware of it, I didn't really know what it was. I want to say that it was around, you know, like 75, 76, when you would see cats out in the park jams and Mm -hmm. everybody's party. And then like, you know, certain parts, they would be cutting up break beats. Brooklyn was real heavy with the disco breaks. Mm. It wasn't really the soul and funk breaks, the disco breaks that really rocked the party. You started seeing cats get on the mic and rhyme. And it was crazy because, like, um, it might be 10 MCs, and out of the 10 MCs, six of them would probably say the same rhyme, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Were you aware at that early age that this was something special, or was it just something that was just happening? What made me feel that hip hop was special was to hear the older generation say that, you know, they ain't doing nothing but talking on the microphone (laughs) or that that bibbity bobbity stuff. That's just going to fade. It'll be gone in in another year or two. Mm. Like to hear the older generation saying that the first thing came to mind is rock and roll. Mm -hmm. You know, I had seen um, movies on Buddy Holly just understanding the views of rock and roll when it first came out. I'm like, yo, this is the same thing. And the older generation don't get it. So I'm like, yeah, we gonna have the same effect, you know? So how did, how did you first get pulled into to rapping? Like, what was your first entry into it? My cousin Murdoch, 
he started rapping. You know, when I heard him doing his thing, I was like, oh, wow. You know what? I, I had, you know, wrote a rhyme for my, uh, my cousin Nicole before. I asked him, can I get down? And when he told me that I was too young and told me he was rapping with these other two dudes from around the corner, I said, well, you know what? If I can write better rhymes than they can, he'll put me down. So I started off trying to write battle rhymes and real braggadocious freestyles and whatnot. And finally, I went and battled the two dudes down with him. Mm. And, you know, after I um, beat both, well, I, let me not say beat both of them, I beat one. The other one refused to battle me, so I just started walking behind him, spitting bars. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? you going to get these bars. But, um, yeah, yeah, exactly, you did. Yeah. After that, people around the way was telling me that I was good, so I stuck with it, and I just kept going from neighborhood to neighborhood, battling different rappers. He wasn't just good. Kane was nice, nice. He started getting a reputation, but he found out very quickly that being the best on the block wasn't enough to make it big in hip-hop. I don't remember my first rhyme, but I remember I remember my last rhyme before I heard Grandmaster Kaz. <laughs> <laughs> After that, everything changed? Yeah, because once I heard Kaz, that's when I, my whole style changed. It was like, yeah, I'll never be successful if I'm not on this dude level. Grandmaster Kaz is literally among the first rappers in history. And as you can hear on his song, Get Down Grandmaster, his rhyming was a step above what most people were doing at the time. Please ain't no one better than the rap veteran. And this here is just another feather in my cap because my rap is synced to the beat. Just like a hi hat, you can try your damnedest to understand this. Showtime is at two to see the grandest. With Brooklyn, we real heavy on, on swag and being fly and, you know, being cocky and arrogant. Mm -hmm. And Kaz was all of that, but in such a clever way. And he had unique flows that I hadn't heard. So I was like, yeah, this dude is something else. Honestly, I really believe that Grandmaster Kaz was like the blueprint of my rap style. After I heard him... Not only did I throw the recent rhyme I wrote away, I threw my whole entire rap book away. I just started all over. It's like, nah, I got to step my pen game up. As Teenage Kane was stepping up his game, he met someone who would change the course of his life. Biz Marquis was another young rapper from Brooklyn, a few years older and more established on the scene. Biz, who sadly died earlier this summer, was the one who helped Kane go from the streets to the big leagues. And once I got down with him, he started taking me to different parties. These promoters called Mike and Dave, they um they did parties like everywhere. And we was opening up for other um hip hop artists that were already out. You know, I'm I'm out of Brooklyn now. I'm rocking a crowd in Harlem. I'm mm. rocking a crowd in the Bronx. I'm rocking a crowd up in Portchester. I'm rocking a crowd, you know, in Long Island. You know, I'm like, yo, this is crazy. You know, I'm going places I never even thought about going. And it's all in New York. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It ain't even around mm -hmm. the world. It's just other places in New York that I never even imagined going, thanks to Biz Marquis. And then, um, you know, so I was like, you know, this, yeah, I think this is really going to happen. I, th I think that, you know, this brother is going to really be instrumental to my career. Kane got another break when he and Biz Marquis were working on a song together called Nobody Beats the Biz and got production help from Queens hip-hop legend Molly Maul. I think Curtis Blow may have been the first person to use a sample on a hip-hop song, but Molly Maul is the one that perfected it. He's the one that perfected sampling. But when Kane went over to Molly's house, I guess Marley didn't, you know, remember me. And I, when I came to bring the rhymes for Nobody Beats the Biz, you know, Marley wasn't going to let me in. But he heard me rhyme, and then he, I came inside Marley crib, and Marley wanted to work with me. And we started mm -hmm. recording. And, you know, that's where, you know, then, you know, it all began, you know. In the mid-'80s, Marley Marl brought Biz Marquis and Kane into the Juice Crew, a rap collective that had a relationship with the label Cold Chillin'. That's how Kane got his record deal. And not long after, he released his debut album, Long live the cane. Now, this was 1988. There's no SoundCloud, no iTunes, no Spotify, nothing. Radio was king. And in New York City, the show every rap fan listened to and every rapper wanted to be on was Mr. Magic's Rap Attack on WBLS-FM. 
Like, I remember, like, the first time I heard Just Rhyming with Biz, you know, my very mm-hmm. first single. Just Rhyming with Biz was a perfect debut for Kane. It featured his friend, Biz Marquis, for some name recognition, and Kane got to drop some fun, complex, swaggery bars. Like, I do remember the first night Mr. Magic played that, me and my boy Mad Money Murph was on the steps screaming. Like little girls, man, and then ran to the corner store and bought like a whole bunch of 40s and whatnot. Came back and we were just celebrating drinking 40s of old E, you know. And um, I remember the first time I heard Raw Mm -hmm. because it was like, you know, when I had just rhyme with Biz out, everybody thought it was Biz's song. So I wasn't getting booked for no shows. And I really just wanted to have something with just me alone. So. Having that ability to have just a Kane song, you know, I'm sitting there waiting for Mr. Magic to play it. You dig? Mm. (laughs) So when he played it, you know, I'm like, yes. Kane was pushing his label to let him record a song without a feature. And finally they gave in. Raw became Kane's first hit without the help of a bigger star like Biz. Lyrically, Kane flexed with energy and urgency. He rode the beat in what would become his early signature style. He didn't know it then, but it was changing the game forever. So when Mr. Magic played Raw on Rap Attack, it felt like the culmination of everything Kane had worked for. I think that when Raw came out, that's when I realized that I had something that no one else had, you know? Like, dudes was at the shows telling me, like, yo, I know your man such and such. Yo, I run with your people such and such, you know? (laughs) And women screaming and stuff. So I realized the change then. But then also, like, Stage wise, when um when me Scoob and Scrap were going to the routines, it was like people would you know become hysterical, man. So we was doing something that no one in hip hop was doing at that time, you know. Scoob and Scrap Lover were Kane's dancers, and another reason Kane stood out lyrically. Kane was one of the best in the game, but his stage performance with Scoob and Scrap dancing, with Kane rhyming on stage, the whole thing was next level. When you put out a song, it's like, you know, okay, do you want to only sell this song to your boys in the hood? Mm -hmm. Do you want to only sell this song to the ladies? You know, it's like understanding your audience, you know, you want to reach the masses. Mm -hmm. So you try to put in elements that cater to everyone. And that's what I was trying to do. And it wasn't just the dancing. Kane was all about pushing the limits of how an MC could look or what they could do. In 1991, he posed nude for Playgirl magazine. The next year, he posed nude again, this time alongside Madonna for her infamous book, Sex. Maybe that doesn't sound so wild today, but in the early 90s, for a young black rapper to be putting himself out there like that, that was pretty much unheard of. I guess it was something that hip hop wasn't quite ready for at the time. But, hey, man, you know, I can't stay here. I'm always trying to elevate and go to the next level. When you look at the game right now, (laughs) that's all you see, really. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff that I've been doing since the late 80s, early 90s, you know. I think I was just a little ahead of my time, you know. I'm not going to apologize for moving too fast. I'm going to... um say that I understand and respect, you know, y'all for not being able to keep up. Right. (laughs) You know. We got to take a break. But when we come back, Big Daddy Kane gives his take on the evolution of hip hop and whether today's stars are doing enough in this moment. Don't touch that dial.
We're back with legendary rapper Big Daddy Kane. The early 90s was definitely Kane's heyday, but he still performs and every now and then puts out new music. Thinking about Kane's music from more than 30 years ago, which trust me, still sounds so good today. I know it makes me sound like an old head, but I can't help but think today's music, I don't know, it, it just can't compare. And I couldn't pass up the chance to ask an OG what he thinks of hip hop's current sound. The younger generation is doing today is a lot different than what we did, you know? But um, as they bring something new into the game, I'm not gonna knock it because what we did back then was bring something new into the game that our older generation didn't understand and a lot couldn't appreciate. So I'm not gonna knock it, I'm gonna wish them well. And if any of the younger cats wanna holler at me and sit and chop it up, man, I got game for days, you know? Hmm. I can tell you, you know, what worked for me, what went wrong for me. I can tell you, you know, what to look out for, who to stay away from, mm. you know. I would love to support, you know, what the younger cats are doing and, um, you know, try to guide them in the right direction in any way possible, you know. Anything that, you know, can um keep them out of jail, keep them alive, and keep their careers um flowing, you know, so they can have longevity in the game. Kane says he can pinpoint when hip hop really started to change, when white corporate America realized there was money to be made. Back when we was doing it, it was still new. Even on up to the early 90s, hip hop was still new. It wasn't new to us. By that point, you know, we had done been there, did his shit and wiped our ass with it. With white America and with corporate America, it was new. And um, figuring out ways to market it and make it very profitable. You see what I'm saying? Once they figured out a way for it to be a lucrative genre, mm -hmm. now it's not artists coming in with their creativity. Yeah. Now you have record execs and radio stations telling you what they want it to sound like. Mm -hmm. So now you're, you know, you're not operating like a culture no more, you're operating like a corporation. Mm. And anybody that know anything about a corporation, whether it be fashion, cars, what so have you. It's like, you know, once quantity comes in, quality goes out for the need for mass production. Has the culture lost something now that rap music is America's pop music? And given that background, you said you had the record labels controlling what was being put out into the culture. What's been lost and what has been gained? Is there something really lost now that we're here where we are? Absolutely. What's been gained is exactly what you said, money. Like, these young cats is getting that bag so crazy. Man, it is so beautiful to see. And to top it off, they're becoming young entrepreneurs. Like, back when we did it, we still was focused on being the dopest MC. Like, we getting bags, but it's still, our mentality is like, he can't mess with me. But now, we got a young generation that's, they get that bag and the first thing they do is start making business decisions. Mm. So I love seeing that, man. I love seeing that. And I hope that these young cats keep that energy, keep that mentality, because they making money we never saw back in the 80s or early 90s. But um, is anything missing? Yes. I think that individuality is missing. Where, like, you can turn on the radio and... You hear 1990, I know that's Chub Rock, mm -hmm. bass, I know that's Chuck G, hallelujah, I know that's Slick Rick, you know, hot damn, I know that's light, you know what I'm saying? Like, everybody sounded so different, everybody had their own style, everybody had their own swag. There was a few biters, there was a few biters, but there was so many people that sounded so different, so many artists where it's like, you know, it was just so much, you know, to mm -hmm. take in. Where, like, now, put on Spotify or, you know, or Pandora or whatever, it's like, you know, you, you might have to listen to the whole song to try to figure out, is that is that little? No. No, I think that's little. Mm. No, it might be because everybody damn near sound the same, you know? And it's like, you know, because you was a part of that trend, you gone because the trend is gone. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like, when this is over, I think the Migos will still be standing. Because hmm. they're the ones that pretty much started this trend. 
And also, they're unique with it. There's a few, I think, that have that originality to them. But I mean, you know, man, hey, man, when this wave is gone, it's a lot that's going to be gone. And, you know, I, I just hope that they understand that, you know, and I hope that some of these artists try to just do something to make people identify with them personally. The commodification of hip hop didn't just change the sound. What rappers were talking about changed too. In the late 80s and the early 90s, there was a wave of socially conscious and pro-black rap from Public Enemy to X-Clan. Now, of course, rap today isn't devoid of protest music, but I asked Kane if there was a moment when the genre started to lean away. In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, I think that everything changed drastically after Puffy did that um, vote or die thing. This is a matter of life and death. This election is life and death, which is why Citizen Change has come up with our campaign slogan, vote or die. See, when you vote for a president this November, you are putting your life and the lives of your family in the hands of someone else. If I'm scaring you, good, because that's how serious this is. Vote or die was a get out the vote campaign aimed at young people in the 2004 election from rapper and mogul Sean Puffy Combs, a.k.a. P. Diddy. And it seemed to work. Four and a half million more young people voted in 2004 than in 2000. Kane says the corporations that ran hip-hop labels took notice and tried to tamp down the calls for change in rap music. The music and the artists had become too powerful. After Puffy did Vote or Die and so many young people came out to vote, it became the focus of controlling the narrative of hip-hop music. Mm. To keep it negative. Yeah. Like, conscious songs are what played on the radio on the regular. Now conscious songs, you got to find. And I don't even just mean in my era, you know, even with like Common, mm -hmm. Talib Kweli, mm -hmm. you know, I could hear them on the radio, like stuff like that you don't hear no more. And I think that like right after that vote or die, that's when you really started really seeing the change. Like, nah, so this hip hop audience mm -hmm. don't get involved in this. We got to pollute them with some negativity and keep it right there. Kane wasn't one of those so-called conscious MCs back in his day, but last year, he released a new track called Enough. He raps about the protests against police brutality and uses parts of his speech from longtime activist Tamika Mallory. And protect and serve who? To me, it seems that they just quick to observe you. And then they have the nerve to come and disturb you. And force a curfew to physically hurt you. I, heard the I know you released the song Enough, right? After the uprisings and after George Floyd and everything's been going on. And I wonder if you think that hip hop and actual MCs are doing enough in this moment. We got police violence, community violence, COVID 19, the racial wealth gap. Is hip hop doing enough to respond to this moment? Nah, much respect to Tamika Mallory and her movement because that young lady and her team, man, they keep both feet on the ground and they've been dedicated, you know, going hard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all day, every day. But I mean, how dedicated are you to that movement? I would love to see a network or some of these um, hip hop joints that, you know, had, you know, a page or a section or something on their site that's dedicated to what she got going on. Mm -hmm. Everything that's going on with police brutality, all these Karens just running around snitching. Mm -hmm. Okay, yo, you see this here? You know what we gonna do, my people? You know what I'm saying? I would love to see some of these other hip hop publications and so on do the same thing to support what Tamika Mallory is doing. I do wanna ask you, in New York City, there was ground broken recently for the Universal Hip Hop Museum. What are your thoughts on that? What's your role in it? Is this a wonderful marker for the impact that hip hop has had on the culture? Even though I've heard some arguments saying that it's gentrification and it speaks to the commodification of hip hop. Where do you fall in this? And obviously it's, it's going to be wonderful to visit, but where, what are your thoughts on it? I think that it's a beautiful thing. Hmm. Number one, when you look at people that's upset with the Grammys, it's like, Every time I look, y'all complaining about the Grammys not supporting black artists, not supporting hip-hop. But we as a people didn't fully support the Soul Train Awards, you know? I mean, it mm -hmm. fell off, and BET had to bring it back. Yeah. It's like 
why are you worried and concerned about someone else's thing not supporting us and not instead creating your own? Soul Train Awards could have, should have been our Grammys. You know what I'm saying? Look at Tyler Perry. He said, F*** Hollywood and made his own. He got his own Hollywood. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? And to me, that's what it's all about. So if you sitting there and you like, they should have had LL Cool J in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yo, how come Big Daddy Kane ain't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Okay, listen. Stop worrying about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Let's create the Hip Hop Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Support it. Build it. And make it worth something of value. To see that they're doing a hip hop museum, I think is beautiful. But to me, the even more beautiful thing about it is not only you gonna go in there and hear about Missy Elliott, Snoop Dogg, Tupac mm -hmm. Secure, you're gonna go in there and hear about MC Shah Rock from the Funky Four Plus One More. You're gonna go in there and hear about Spoonie G. You're gonna go in there and hear about Cool Herc. You know? You're mm -hmm. gonna go in there and hear about Disco King Mario and know the importance of these people, these forefathers that did so much for the culture before it even really became a thing. I support it 100% and I can't wait to see it open. And I would love to be one of those dudes that's that's showing people around. Yeah, I I do that for them for two weeks for free. You you dig? Man, listen, I want to be there on that day. That's the day I want to be there, man. <laughs> you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about this uh, summer concert series in New York. You're about the headline. And I want to ask, how does it feel to be coming back to Brooklyn? You're Brooklyn born and bred. How does it feel to come back here and perform for people who love you, respect you, and love your music? I mean, it's always an honor to perform in Brooklyn, you know, because I mean, I feel like, you know, as an MC just beginning in 1982, everything I knew about rapping, I had learned from Brooklyn, you know, from um, watching, you know, the, um, the hustlers that come on the corner and, you know, give you a $20 bill to run to the store to get them a Lucy cigarette or a Michelob or something and tell you to keep the change. You know, listen to the cats in the barbershop talking in slick rhymes, you know, saying little stuff, you know, while they arguing with each other and stuff like that. You know, seeing cats in their gaiter shoes and they three, four, five piece suits and whatnot, you know. So to come back home is always an honor, always an honor. And I always want to do my best when I'm on stage in Brooklyn. Big Daddy Kane, thank you for everything you've given to the culture and thank you for your time today, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you, brother. All right, man. Y'all have a great one. That was hip-hop legend Big Daddy Kane. He's back in Brooklyn today, Thursday, August 19th, to headline a free show for New York City's Homecoming Week. You can stream it online, and we'll drop a link in our show notes. You can tweet me, at Tremaine Lee. That's at Tremaine Lee, my full name, or write to us at intoamerica at nbcuni.com. That was intoamerica at nbc and the letters uni.com. Into America is produced by Isabel Angel, Allison Bailey, Bryson Barnes, Aaron Dalton, Max Jacobs, Shaka Tafari, Aisha Turner, and Lushik Waba. Original music is by Hannes Brown. I'm Tremaine Lee. Catch you next Thursday. <laughs>